Yes, it is literally like plugging. Are you plugging self-congratulating two things yourself for your ability to plug things in? I mean, I people would hear you making fun of me if you would talk into the mic. From ScienceSortOf.com, you're listening to Science Sort Of. Hey there, Paleo Posse. It is Ryan here, and uh, this is a little bit different episode. We haven't done a special edition in a while, but I was fortunate enough to go to the American Geophysical Union's annual meeting in San Francisco two weeks ago, uh, mid-December, and uh, I was able to go as press. So in addition to giving a talk on scientific outreach, I also got to talk to other people about their outreach and about their science. So this is the culmination of that. I'm going to split it into two parts just so it's not too long. And the theme that kind of emerged not necessarily in a planned way, but just kind of came out was oceans and outreach. So each segment here is going to have two interviews that I did with folks at AGU and uh, talking about primarily ocean science, but also about scientific outreach. So our first episode is going to begin with an interview I did with Martin Huecker Martinez, who studies ocean fluxes uh, around Antarctica. And then we're going to finish up this episode with me talking to our old friend Jane Zelkova about some of the really cool outreach and activism work that she's been doing herself. And then um, I'll come back at the end for some quick plugs. And then I will see you again shortly for part two for more oceans and outreach. So let's get uh, right into it with uh, my conversation with Martine. And thanks um, oddly to the iFanboy guys, because I guess Martine was following me on Twitter because of iFanboy. And that's how he saw that I was at the meeting and we were able to connect. So comics bring in scientists together, which is pretty cool. All right, here we go. So yeah, so my wife isn't a scientist, so I'm I can talk about science to someone who isn't in the ivory tower. Um, like she taught first grade when we met while I was getting my master's degree, and then she um, taught she taught middle school science briefly. And so like like they don't test middle school when at least when she was teaching, they don't test medical science in mm-hmm. California. And oh, okay. so like she taught she taught a like math science joint class. So she spent. 99% of the time on math. Math, yeah. And then um, when she did science lessons, she'd like run them by me to make sure she wasn't saying something completely ridiculous, which was a hoot. Sure, I bet. But um, it's probably, is it fun to like go back to super basic? It uh, basic, is. not like basic to make it sound less than, but just basic so, like, because it's simpler. Despite there being many things wrong with Feynman, like sort of the idea that if you can't explain it to someone off the street, you don't get it. You're right. It's something that I sort of really, really, you know, ascribe to. Like that's. Because like, if if I can't use regular words, then I then I, I'm relying on the crutch of jargon and you know complex mathematics to get me to a place where I you know don't actually can't get there on my own. Right. I, I did an event yesterday where I was talking about the use of jargon because of the Upgoer Five challenge, mm-hmm. and the Upgoer Five challenge almost to me makes the counterwise point that like oh there's a reason we use jargon because yeah. so the the thing the Upgoer Five challenge sort of hurts me and my heart. So I'm an oceanographer. Like my PhD is in oceanography. Yeah, I'll go ahead and introduce oh, you. Yeah. Uh, we are chatting with Martin Hecker Martinez from the University of Michigan, who uh, had a poster here at AGU. But we've kind of launched into talking about science and science outreach generally, and I, I think we should just keep chatting about that before we get into the, the nitty gritty. Yeah. So, so I also went to a, a workshop here on the Upgoer Five. Um, it's like this weekend, and. The there's another that, one this afternoon. Yeah. So one thing that made me sad, like, ocean is in the list. Yeah. Which, you know what is in the list? C. Mm. And I was, I've been thinking about this a lot, because one of the points I made when we did... Well, I cut you off, so what was oh, your no. point about ocean? Oh, just to, like, like, I'm an oceanographer, so it makes me sad. Like, the, the thing that I study doesn't make the cut. <laughs> right, but now you just have to refer to yourself as a sea person. Sea person, yeah. Because I've been thinking about this a lot, and in that thousand most common words, there's a really strong bias towards Germanic words and mm. a bias against Latin words. Because most of the common words that we use in English when we're just talking back and forth to each other are Germanic in origin. Most of the scientific words we use are Greek and Latin. Um, so ocean is a Latin Greek word. Sea comes from Old English German. So sea made the cut, but ocean didn't. So clearly... Upgoer 5 is biased against my, my Spanish-speaking side. Yeah, that's it's, what bi- I've it's learned. biased against Latinos, for sure. <laughs> that's what I've learned. And <laughs> I, I think that's unfortunate because, well, and it's, it's also, you know, 
the 50 cent words tend to be the words that you learn yeah. to be a scientist. So we say cognition instead of thinking. It's true. No, and I, I mean, it's chewing it's, instead of, or masticating instead of chewing. chewing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which masticate is what you say when you're yeah, chewing in Spanish. Exactly. Like it's, yeah, yeah. it's, it's, it's the five cent word. What I've realized <laughs> it, what I've realized when I am trying to, cause I, cause, because a lot of the science I do also is in Central America. Mm-hmm. I try to make sure that I always write my abstracts in Spanish as mm. well. I can't do the whole paper in Spanish. I'm not that proficient, but I at least want to make, I want to provide an avenue of accessibility towards the Spanish speaking world. Like I'm working in your culture. I'm studying the animals that live in your world. Yeah. I want to make sure I am. You want to be a good guest. Yeah, exactly. But, and so I've realized that if I, if I write out my English abstract using the fanciest, most highfalutin words I can imagine, it translates <laughs> so easily into Spanish because they all, all the, cognates. Yeah, exactly. Because that's where all the words came from in the English. So exactly like the masticata versus just saying chewing. Yeah. yeah. Well, get back to the upcore, like the upcore five, like that was, but like it is, I think it really is a, it's a, it's a good exercise for, you know, either translate your thesis title or your dissertation title or translate your abstract into, into it is, it's a good step. Cause like if you don't get what you, um, if you can't explain what you're doing in simple language, maybe you don't really get it and you mm-hmm. should sort of spend some more time sort of refining how you think about it. Yeah, it does. It forces you to rethink your own yeah. position on it. And I think it also just like breaks you out of the habit of assuming that people know words that they probably don't know. Yeah. And that's, that's good too. Yeah. Cause there's, there's, yeah, there's a bias. People, people don't want to admit that they don't know something. Right. I mean, it's that I always chuckle whenever a lecturer says like, okay, you know, uh, how many people here know Pythagorean theorem? Raise your hand if you don't know it. So I know to explain it. And I'm like, nobody's going to raise their hand. Yeah. Either decide that you're going to explain it or assume that everyone knows it. And then recognize that you're going to lose X percent of people who didn't know it and yeah. were afraid to say anything. So when I do talks and posters now, I would say close to 50% of the content is introductory material, ex- explanations, you know, a- a introducing the methods, just all of it. Because Sadly, sort of, as you, you've seen my poster, mm-hmm. you see, I do not have, I have not learned that lesson yet. I've learned the pretty picture lesson. <laughs> Which is very important. <laughs> but yeah. the other lessons are still sort of sinking in for me. So I'm a postdoc at University of Michigan. I figure I could I give you that yeah, please. Um, background. So I, um, I did my PhD at Oregon State, um, where I was an oceanographer, and now I'm doing the project working on now is actually looking at basically looking at what's coming out of the ocean from an airplane. Right. So like the, the, the plus side to sort of doing a postdoc is you sort of, you get to jump as far as you can from what you do while still sort of finding the core, right? Cause I mean, you're a PhD student. Like if you don't love what you do, right. You're done. Yeah. It might take a couple of years to figure it out <laughs> that you're done, but like you have to find that. You don't get paid enough to do it yeah, for the money. Exactly. Like, and so like I got a master's degree going into PhD, into PhD career on something that I did not love. And I left because if you don't love the thing, you shouldn't be there. Mm-hmm. And as much as ocean isn't in the list, I love the ocean. Like I grew up in Seattle. I like like the ocean is the thing. Okay. And so I got to you know. Be I was going to ask how you how you got into it, but it's, you just yeah. grew up with it. I grew up I grew up across the street from Elliott Bay, looking at the ocean, and it was like it wasn't when I did science. It wasn't like what I did. Mm-hmm. Like I like science. Like I thought, like my bachelor's is in physics. Like I, I can, I can talk thermodynamics and quantum mechanics in great detail. Like I, I almost got a, a double major in math. Like that's the stuff that those are the tools that are most readily sort of you know most easily available to me. Mm-hmm. But it's not the thing that I love, and so it took me a long time to learn the difference between the things that are easy and the things that are rewarding. Yeah, because I mean. The sort of the transition from the transition to graduate school, sort of you, you, you stop being a professional student and turn into something else that mm-hmm. I have yet to sort of, um, const- to sort of, I don't know, congeal in my mind as for what that is. It's, it is, yeah, grad school is weird because you do, I feel like you start as a student because you're taking classes and you're still partying with your friends and all that other yeah. stuff. And then at some point, without you really noticing, it transitions to a job. Yep. And you're working pretty regular hours, long but regular hours, and, you know, you're, making a budget and thinking about your salary and not taking classes anymore. So it just be, somehow becomes a job, even though your title never changes. Yeah. And it's this weird, weird thing. Like I, and I failed at it once. I mean, I, I was doing material science. I was grinding up powders and putting it, I was like, I'm playing with mud like a kindergartner and like, and there was no, as a paleontologist, I find that appealing, but that's fine. Yeah. Like I sift, I was like, <laughs> I, I was grinding powders and sifting them through sieves and like, and, and there was, but for me, there was no love there. Mm-hmm. And so unsurprisingly, I walked away from that. Right. And so in reconsidering, it's like, like, what's the thing that I love? It's like, I have all these math, math skills, but we'll think about that. Like that needs to come second. And so I was like, like, I like the ocean and I discovered oceanography. So the, the downside of earth sciences in general is that 
most places your undergraduate degree isn't in that. Like you either okay. have you have physicists or chemists or biologists or like so you're so, saying there are no places that have like a department of oceanography in for undergraduates they're rare yeah there are a few so you have um, to major in something else that you can then apply yeah. to getting postgraduate training yeah in that because they see sort of the undergraduate degree as sort of as you get the tools you need to do the work later um, and also like I mean like all the earth sciences here right they're all very sort of interdisciplinary you mm-hmm. sort of and they require a lot of collaboration and that actually in of itself also is appealing like the idea that you can't do earth science alone mm-hmm. you can you can do physics on your own in some sense like you can you could fabricate you and a, you and a whiteboard and some you markers, and a whiteboard yeah. or you and a small and you know you and a cadre of graduate students who are all you know you who are your underlings who do your bidding mm-hmm. but it is a it can be a one person show you can't do that on a ship so you can argue like from NSF standpoint like the cost of simply sending a, a, an aircraft or sending a ship out is so big that you the ideas that need to be serviced by the experiment are too big to fit in one person's head and we say like that's true with the project that I'm on here it's true for the project that I was on when I was in grad school it's kind of this weird like science has developed its own in its own sense like a into a super organism structure yeah where yeah like you said it's too big to fit in one person's head which didn't wasn't always the case. No. I mean, I think I, I remember reading at some point. And it sounds like one of those made-up facts, and it probably is that Francis Bacon is considered the last person to have basically the entirety of human knowledge in his head at one time. And past that point, there's been too much for any one person to, to grasp yeah. it all. And that's probably a good thing. Like it because what good is if you can't communicate with people who are also experts in related fields? You mm-hmm. can't communicate it to the layperson, if you can't communicate to the layperson, what you're doing can't add to the greater value. It is. I do find it as, this is something we never talked about on the show before, but I find it as challenging to talk to other scientists as I do to find it talking to the general public. Because the general public's a clean slate yeah. in most cases. If, if anything, they have a slight negative bias against science mm-hmm. and math because they didn't like it in school yeah. for whatever reason. But talking to other scientists, they're bringing so much of their own stuff already to the table. It can be really difficult to cross that barrier and talk to them about the stuff you're doing and get them to, to engage with it and comprehend it. Like everyone has their favorite hammer. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, no, to- <laughs> totally. It's like, I, I, I'm surprised, you know, I'm, next time I talk to an astronomer, they're like, well, have you tried looking at sloths through a telescope? And I'm like, <laughs> no, I haven't. Cause... Or like, or like, or astronomer who does spectra, they're like, well, have you done spectra of their hair? Or yeah, yeah like everyone has the thing that they do. I've done mass spectrometry of their hair. Yeah. So. Which, actually, we had a mass spec on the airplane. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. so let's talk about this a okay. little bit. So, so now you study orcas. Now I study so, so the Yeah. <laughs> so scientists love acronyms. I'm pretty sure you've, you've, you've talked about the love of acronyms yeah. for scientists. I'm going to go ahead and just read your title out right. so, so people have a, some sense. Using Lagrangian flights and modeling to study O2 and CO2 fluxes over the southern ocean during the O2 slash N2 ratio and CO2 airborne study orcas. All right, so... In that, so in that title, sort of to fail the the, the Upgore Five challenge, right? Sort of Lagrangian is some guy's name, right? Lagrange. What if somebody went through the entire abstract book and see if there to see if there was even a single <laughs> title that passed that the Upgore passed. Five? I bet there's, there's got to be some. No, no, I'm skeptical. I, I, I just saw my abstract for next year. Nah. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I, yeah. I, there's got to be, some, but uh, the whole well, the title you probably could find a title. I don't know about a. Uh, the, the abstract would be would be not rough. a whole abstract. Yeah, that'd be rough. Maybe a title. Okay, yeah. so yeah, so, so let's break okay. down. So Lagrange is, is some guy's name. So that, that that word should have no meaning to someone who's outside sort of fluid mechanics. Um, basically, when you look at fluid mechanics, there's two ways of looking at it. You can either your observer, the person who's actually taking the measurements, can stand in one place and watch the world go by, or you can catch a ride with the fluid that you're in and go along. Okay. And so Lagrange is, and we give them two people's names. Eulerian is you sit, sit in one place and the world goes by you. Lagrange, Euler. Eulerian, Euler, as in Euler. as in E, e yeah. yeah, as in the German guy who yeah, yeah. has like thousands of mathematical things named after okay, him. Okay, yeah, the Euler. E number. Yeah. yeah, E is the Euler number. Right. Yeah. yeah okay. So he like like his like sort of the way of looking at, at fluid mechanics is name that involves sort of watching the river go by is Eulerian. The guy in the boat drifting along is Lagrange. I love that. That's that's. Very poetic. So the the way to think about it is if you like if you learn like freshman physics or someone or someone teach you physics in high school like sort of you have like you have your, your ball and you you know you have force equals mass times acceleration you sort of push on it that's actually more a Lagrangian way of looking at things because your ball is the the thing and you sort of think about the motion of that thing as it goes along. So quick question: Is this the same Lagrange that we get the Lagrange points yes. from? Okay, same Lagrange. But these are it's a totally different thing we're talking about. So, well. So this is sort of back to the Francis Bacon idea. There was a time where 
all of this, all of sort of human knowledge fit inside one person's head. Like they were sort of among those last people to be there. And so they get, they have their fingerprints on lots of sort of mathematical physics ideas. And so yeah, and it's same Lagrange and it's sort of because of that. Like he's, he's sort of, the, the, the ideas are how we, how we put the way things move into numbers and symbols sort of once we found a way that worked, we sort of stick with it. Okay, cool. Um, All right, I'm with you. And so, so Lagrange, basically, the idea is sort of we're trying to do something where we're, we're measuring something in the air as it goes along over the Southern Ocean. So sort of set the scene, like the, the place where we care about, like we're actually looking over Drake Passage, so between the southern tip of South America and the Antarctic Peninsula. Right. And we actually, get, we were based out of Punta Arenas, which... Um, is in southern Chile? Which is in southern Chile, yeah. And there is... So there... I think there are sloth fossils down there. There might be. Keep an eye out for me, please. <laughs> well, I, I, I saw penguins. That was pretty cool. There you go. Yeah. I saw, yeah, the, the coolest things I saw were penguins and an iceberg. I got to go on one flight. So my, my work is mostly computer modeling. So, But you're modeling the data that's coming back from these flights yeah, over so, Drake's Passage. Yeah. So before we went, I actually had to come up with a way to use weather forecasts to put them in the model and say, okay, if we fly the plane here, where did the air that we measured, where did it come from? Oh, cool. Okay. Because since we care about what's coming out of the ocean, like we want to be like, well, if it came over South America, we don't want to fly in that area today. So it's kind of like that thing where you have to shoot ahead of where the target's going to be. Yes. You have to figure out where your target was when you're flying through. Exactly. It. That's cool. That's very, very much sort of the root of sort of what I'm doing. It's like, like sort of follow, like shooting ahead of where the target's going so we can catch it on the way. And so. I had to create sort of, so I signed up in, in September. I was like, you have to have a forecast system up and running by, you know, January 1st so we can start planning these flights, which was cool. And I got to learn all sorts of fun things about weather forecasting. And I was like, I'm, I'm an oceanographer. I don't know what I'm, like, I'm now out of my element, almost literally. Mm -hmm. So now I can claim my master of all fluids because I've gone from, from the, the one that I started on to sort of both. Because the thing that in my PhD is really interested me and why sort of part of why I applied for the job that I, that I have now is because... In my PhD, I was looking at sort of how the atmosphere pushes the ocean around and sort of how, how that influence transcends that barrier. And same thing here. So now I sort of, it's, I sort of take my world, flip it upside down, and instead of on a ship, I get to go on an airplane. That's really cool. Next up, submarines. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so the biologists actually, the biologists and the geologists are the ones who have the lock on the submarines. Oh, yeah? Yeah. So the, the and no, not even the, yeah, basically them, because the, the chemists and the physicists, which is sort of the, bu the bucket that I put myself in, like we can just send our instruments down and we don't need to be there. Mm, okay. But I mean, you, you do sort of animal things. Like, mm -hmm. like, like there's, there's, a, there's a qualitative aspect to it where you just need to see the thing in its place. But all the, uh, all the marine sloths are extinct. But there was a lineage <laughs> of marine sloths. <laughs> Like they kind of, to me, they look like kind of shaggy manatees. Mm, I can see sort of like the sort of slowly, yeah, pad, they're, slowly they're, paddling they, around. They, I imagine them as like a cross between a manatee and an otter, like a slow otter <laughs> or kind of maybe a, a little bit of a sleeker manatee. Well, I imagine there's, there's, there's got to be places where you could probably dig around in the muck underwater and find fossils, though. You know, the ocean floor, because of the way it tectonically turns over so much more quickly than continental shelf, unless it gets uplifted out of the water, the odds of things preserving and not getting completely degraded by the water is so basically in the like, ocean is lower like the new zealand uplift is basically the only bo ocean bottom you're excited about like, i don't know i don't know if people are doing true deep water marine paleontology there are obviously a lot of places in the caribbean where you have these inland sinkholes that have developed mm -hmm. because of the karst topography and the yeah. bicarbonate shelf and all that where you can find fossils that fell in these sinkholes mm -hmm. and have been submerged for a long time but they're not exposed to currents and wave action because mm -hmm. obviously those are going to be destructive forces yeah. to a fossil so any basically any high energy environment is tough to get decent fossils. Bad news, yeah. yeah. I guess yeah, so when I think of marine fossils, I think of my friends who are staring through microscopes looking at. Yeah, I mean obviously the foraminal know, record is, stuff, am, is yeah. amazing, and I did um, I did a lot of forum work as an undergrad because <laughs> I worked for Jim Zakos, hmm. and so I was picking so I can I can pick out a nautiloides from hundred yards. You know that's that's the one. That 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 is a skill I do not have, and I'm impressed <laughs> by the, the, the ability to sort of identify taxa is. is impressive <laughs> well you probably know way more equations than i know so you have your own skill set that's true so anyway so i was, I was i've gone afield the, the sort of part of the show so the the work that we do so we, we we're basically looking over the southern ocean because there's some disagreement in the scientific community about basically how good a job so we're measuring gas compositions so we're measuring how much co2 there is in the air how much oxygen there is in the air oh, and then like so we had mass specs so we have a whole bunch of um small 
sort of simple chemical species we're also measuring. And the one that I put on the poster is this thing called DMS. Basically, it comes from an algal bloom. So when, when, when okay. algae sort of grows a bunch, it's, sort of, it's a signature. Um, it doesn't last very long in the atmosphere. Um, it reacts with stuff and sort of decays away. And so if we see it, we say, well, we must, be, we must be downwind of a, we must be close and downwind of some large amount of algae. I imagine that's the sort of thing we should expect to see more and more of with climate change. We should. So the, the, the idea, the, the question, the, the big question that the project sort of intends to answer, or let me restate, the big question that my part of the project, because like I said, sort of the, all the ideas in the project don't fit in one person's head. So like this aircraft went from 100 meters off the surface of the ocean to 12 kilometers up. Oh, wow. So, like, there are people who are worried about, you know, exchange between the stratosphere and the troposphere. So, actually, like, so where the weather, like, you know, that's, I guess, are, the, I mean, are those sort of well understood I think people terms? understand that there are different layers of our atmosphere, atmosphere yeah. whether they understand the specifics, yeah. I, I, like, don't. I, the mean, troposphere, I don't. Like, like the troposphere is where the weather is. Like, okay. Cla- like, 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 if you see the top of a thunderstorm, that's the top of the troposphere. Okay. And then the stratosphere sort of is where, is where things sort of are stratified, hence stratosphere. And so that's, and it's, so it's harder to, it's harder to mix up there. I feel like people colloquially use the term stratospheric just to refer to things that are really high, but yeah. without really knowing what it means. Yeah, basically where y- you have a much harder time having a, I mean, th- I think actually the, the picture to have in your head is basically a thunderstorm is like you have hot air going up as fast as it can, and all of a sudden it starts to hit air where it actually, where, actually, actually when we're in this hall, there's this cool thing. So if you, if you, if you come in here, so we're on the we're on the third floor of a three story building. We're on the third floor, yeah. The Moscone West is this, and it has these ridiculously tall ceilings. Mm-hmm. If you um, leaving here in, at night, so you go down that last set of escalators, and you notice sort of when you hit that when you hit that first floor, it's sort of it's hot, and then you still go down to the bottom, and it's cold because all the cold airs come in. So that sort of leveling of the air mm-hmm. is what's happening in the stratosphere. So as you go up in the stratosphere, air gets hotter. Okay. And that makes it it's so it makes it harder for you to sort of have the the air sort of punch up through there because you already you're trying normally right you have hot air at the at the surface of the earth and it goes up and if the air is getting colder then you can actually have you know like a balloon it rises but if i had really hot air on top the balloon would stop because it's like oh i'm no longer hotter than the air above right there. okay anyway so there are people who are interested in how the air from the troposphere so where the weather is mixes with the stratosphere and so we have instruments that are running up at 12 kilometers up trying to sort of see you know so there are kind of multiple projects running multiple at once. projects running at once because there's a lot of interesting things happening there. So like one of the people who sort of is part of these sort of works for, um, one of the guys worked for Ralph Keeling, who's the son of, oh, what is his dad's name? Wait, is this the Keeling plot guy? Yes, the son of the Keeling plot guy. Oh, wow. Charles Keeling, the son of Charles Keeling, Ralph Keeling. I might be wrong on Charles, but anyway, Ralph is Ralph's name. Um, <laughs> I know Ralph. Um, <laughs> Link in the show notes, people. Just yeah. go see the show notes. So Ralph and his graduate student, like they made a plot of showing, um, so we were, we, we were down there last February, so February and January of 2016. And they made a plot showing you could actually see the CO2 from the anthropogenic CO2. So you could actually see the line of 400 ppm CO2 as we sort of traced it across Drake Passage. Wow. So like over Antarctica, it was still just below. And over um, South America, it was already above. And so because if you... Cause and you then, then the, that's where they're mixing is that... Yeah. And so, yeah so and you can actually... There, and there's like, just like there's a, the station at, Ma, at Mauna Loa, there's actually stations all around the world that are run partially by... Um, I think it's other. I think it's by Noah. Actually, I could probably send you. I'll send you a link for that. Perfect. Yeah. Where you can actually see sort of how the CO2 at at the, at the South Pole. There's a station there. Sort of slowly, sort of it it lags. So it's it's behind what's happening in the northern hemisphere because all of the all the most industrial. Pe- most people live in the northern. Hemisphere. Turns out there are more humans in the northern <laughs> yeah. hemisphere than the southern hemisphere. Yeah. And also, if you've seen the the, the Mauna Loa curve or the Keeling curve, depending on how you want to call it. Um, you can, I learned it as a Keeling curve. Yeah. But. So, if you, so if you've seen the Keeling curve, it's not just sort of this, this it's not this continual increase, right? So where there's this, there's this undulation, this yearly mm-hmm. oscillation in there. And that yearly oscillation, you don't get that at the South Pole. The South Pole just slowly goes up. Hmm. And that's because of the way it mixes? It's because, so the, the, undula- the actual oscillation is actually from, it's from fall. It's from when the, when the, leaves, when the leaves fall and rot in the, in the fall time. Oh, fall. okay. Like so that, there's a big all, excursion when that happens. Yep. Interesting. Yeah. So... So if we got rid of all the deciduous trees, then it would just be a constant slope up as opposed to, you know, wiggles on top of it. So we get a little bit of a reprieve thanks to fall. And yeah, everybody in loves spring, fall. in the spring. So you, the yeah, so th- th- things get you get more CO2 as fall goes to winter. And, and then you, spring draws it back down because back everybody down. starts drinking yep. air again. Yep, cuz all the trees have to leaf up. Cool. So you know some biology? I do know some biology, <laughs> which are chemistry or something. Anyway, so we go down there and we're measuring, so, we, 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 so they made this really awesome plot. I can also I can send you a link to the, the actual project site showing sort of the, the, that front sort of moving down, that sort of that, that line of the concentration. Um, so there are people who care about how that happens. Also, 
if we if we if the plane can't go any higher, but if the plane could go higher, if you actually go up in the stratosphere, just like so, it's hard to mix up there. If you actually keep going up, you actually can get lower CO2 concentrations because it gives you a, an idea of how long it took the air to get to that altitude. But I've gone afield. Um, <laughs> so we're measuring stuff over the Southern Ocean, and my so once I made these the the predictions, the, the basically the weather forecast for where we where we might or might not want to fly. So various people sort of we sit down. So we we have these these plans in hand the day before the the morning before the flight, and then all the scientists sit in a big conference room and argue about where we want to send the plane, <laughs> um, because some people want care about these large scale um, mm -hmm. gradients, um, and my advisor and I um, we care about sort of the small scale what's actually happening at the ocean surface. And so we actually like when we're trying to argue for a flight, we're arguing for a, like we're actually arguing for a pair of flights. So we just want to go there and back. Yeah, we want to catch. We want to catch what, what what's what's it doing right now, and yeah. then we catch the same air the next day to actually figure out what the what the change is. And sort of with because you can't. If I want to say sort of how much stuff is coming out of the ocean, I have to know well what happened before it rubbed against the ocean and what was it after. Sure, that makes sense. Um, and in, in essence, sort of this has been done over the continent before. And so there you're measure. So there you're measuring you know, the output of you know oil wells. You're measuring the output of coal burning power plants or methane burning power plants so so you have real sort of significant signals of, of changes of co2 like there you're measuring like tens tens of parts per million that are coming out so these are these are you're ringing the bell pretty loud i like that that turn of phrase yeah down there like the output is is tiny like we're measuring changes on the order of like half a part per million okay or maybe one part per million so the idea of being able to actually measure how much co2 is going into or coming out of the ocean hadn't been tested before and so this was that part of the project was kind of a reach it's like well we're, we're gonna we're definitely gonna be able to measure what's going on sort of on that big north south gradient but when we're gonna try to do this sort of before after calculate the flux study and that's, and that's yeah exactly in your in your title you have this idea of flux yeah right? and that's so the, the flux is the change over that yeah, yeah so flux is basically is, is a measurement of how much is coming out of or going into the ocean right and so we tried this this approach in two places we tried it over drake passage so we went what is the flux capacity? Of the ocean? <laughs> Sorry, I just I was working out of the joke for life. <laughs> Believe me, sort of fl uh, flux capacitor jokes happen, and Good. it's okay. Good. Sadly, the plane goes much faster than eighty-eight miles an hour, so uh, it's it's not. So you really... will see some serious. Yeah, we we do see some serious. <laughs> In fact, we, like we, you get salt spray on the on the on when the you're wish. that low, yeah, yeah, you yeah, get salt spray. For, counts as serious when you're in a turbo turbo prop plane. Sure. Like they had to get they had to um, come up with special procedures on how to rinse out the engines. Oh wow! Because it's sucking in air. It's sucking in salt yeah. and air. Yeah. So we go out and we we actually we tried it in two places. We tried it over Drake Passage. So we went to the west and the east one one day and the next day, and we actually measure. We don't not only do we measure sort of we can say not only how much flux or how much CO two is coming out over going into the ocean, but we can also measure get an idea of where it is. So we actually see like if you're closer to Antarctica, we actually measured CO two going into the ocean, but out over sort of the middle of the passage, CO two is coming out of the ocean. And one of the questions that the project was intended to answer, so like, so in summertime, the water heats up, and just like when you heat up your soda, it, you know, all the, goes all flat. the, all the it goes flat. Like, the Southern Ocean is heating up in the summertime because it's summer. Yeah. Um, and so the gases come out. So, like, CO2 comes out and oxygen comes out because it, it, it isn't as soluble. It and we know, we know chemically that carbon dioxide dissolves better into cold water, but we probably didn't know the rate that was occurring. Yeah, yeah, we don't know the rate that's occurring because we have the, the countervailing process. We have the, the algae that are growing, that are trying their best to do what the leaves in the summertime do, right? Or leaves in the springtime do, right? They're they're turning, you know, CO2 into sugar. And so you're trying to figure out how well the balancing act is working. Yeah, we're seeing who yeah, which which process is winning out. And it turns out that the process that, that seems to be winning out by the continent, so where the where the edge of the ice is, is the growth of the of the algae. On the other hand, out in the middle of the passage, the thing that's winning out is either is either temperature or potentially even respiration. So it's potentially um, just, you know, zooplankton, little krill and such, eating up the algae and respiring and turning that CO2 back into, or turning that oxygen sugar back, back into, yeah. turning that sugar back into, into CO2. And actually, we, we even measure some oxygen being sucked into the ocean hmm. out in the middle of Drake Passage. So we can actually see a respiration signal in one place and a photosynthesis signal in a different place. And so... Uh you know, sometimes when you learn the basics of oceanography, you talk about this concept that the ocean is kind of the lungs of the planet. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like you're measuring that on a really small scale yeah. to then be able to better model how it happens over a large scale. Exactly. There's a, in the oral presentation, presentation section of sort of the, the, where my poster was in, there was the closest thing to a full-on fight that happens in science 
because the Southern Ocean is really terribly sampled. So with the exception of, so from Punta Arenas, Chile, there's a U.S. scientific base in Antarctica in Palmer, which is on the west side of the Antarctic Peninsula. And there's a ship that does resupply runs there pretty regularly throughout the year. We actually got to go on it because cool. I know. This is a big icebreaker? Big icebreaker, yeah. Oh, Natural man. icebreaker. Wow. Um, and we didn't get to go out to sea on it. We just got to go see icebreaker, which was pretty cool. Yeah. I have to say. That's one of those, like, yeah. I can't believe humans built this sort yeah. of things. Actually, f- funny story. So these, they were built by a company. I remember, yeah, they were built by a company in the U.S. And when they first built them, they were way too tippy. So they had to weld on these, like, like water wings on the, <laughs> on the side. You, I'm serious. Like you, you see them. So like right at the water line, there's these like these like extra like bump outs on the on both sides to help its to help its stability. I did not know that. That's hilarious. This is this this is how I, I mean engineers, man. Engineers. I mean better better to fix it than not. I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, before I went down there, some of them they actually had a flight where they actually had to plan to fly over the Palmer, because in addition to all these gas measurement devices we had, we actually had uh, we borrowed an instrument from NASA, which was a very fancy camera. It's a, an imaging spectrometer. So most cameras, right, you have your pixels that go in two directions. What they do is they actually take that grid of pixels and in one direction they turn it into a spectrometer. And so you get a line image, but then you actually get spectral information as opposed to just, you know, red. Because normally, right, you're in your camera, you just have red, blue, and, and green pixels. Mm-hmm. Yep. So this camera, they actually just had photo sensors and they actually take the light and actually break it into various frequencies. And so you actually get a spectra of a line and so as you fly over so you're dragging this line across the ocean you actually get a sort of 3d image or don't well a 3d data set of a 2d image so you can look at how much light at 700 nanometers is coming out of the ocean and you can get a picture of that or how much light at 400 nanometers is coming out of the ocean you get a picture of that and so that team had people on the on the icebreaker and so while the icebreaker was doing one of its runs down south we actually had to we flew the plane over the icebreaker so we could compare our measurements from the airport aircraft to their measurements. That's of the so ship. cool. But again, this is the point. Like science, like science, at least Earth science, is sort of all these sort of things that have sort of hooked together, and everyone sort of does little bits and pieces of it. Very cool. And so, uh, what were kind of your like your big conclusions from at least this part of the study? So the big conclusions from this part is that we can actually use an aircraft to measure oceanic fluxes like that. Like so, this like, works. It works. Yeah, like when, like when we were planning those flights, like there were strong arguments sitting in that conference room in Punta Arenas like this is like it's not going to work why are we doing this <laughs> it's like we said we were going to try and so like those two the two flights we did back to back over Drake Passage were actually done they were the antepenultimate and the penultimate flight so they weren't the last two flights but they were almost the last two flights because of sort of the people who there was so, resistance there's resi- also the so my advisor and I were the two people who actually were sort of on the project to do that particular thing. And we were down there at the end of the project. And so since we weren't there in person to advocate for what we wanted, other people's sort of needs came first. And that's fine. Out like, of sight, out of mind. Yeah. yeah. Like we went, so we like were calling in from Michigan, which is only a couple hours away from Punta Arenas. Thank right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's almost, yeah, yeah, it's almost due south. But if we're not there, sort of, you don't get to advocate sort of for your position. Um, thankfully, one of the people on the project actually did try to do one where instead of doing you know, flight before and the next day the flight after they actually did when we're in one flight, they tried to sort of resample the same air they flew through before. And that flight, they went into the Argentine basin. So they went um, east of South America, um, where they had to sort of fly around the Falkland Islands or Las Islas Malvinas, depending on which language you use. Is that also, wait. The Falkland Islands sort of. But, but is that is that a language thing? But it, Or is that the that war That is thing? a, yeah, both. Okay. So apparently the way, the, the, so the way it was explained to me, is depending which language you use, you use the name that that language of the of, of the country that uses that language. Okay, so um, Falklands so, in English because the British because claim the them. British claim them. So the Islas Malvinas yeah, in because, Spanish because Argentina claims them. And then what are the people on the so, Falklands called? Them? <laughs> the, I, I think that sort of on the ground, I think the Brits have them right now. Yeah. Last last I heard, popular support was to yes. stay with Britain. Yes, and so the but like it's it's we had to so we had permission to fly in Argentinian airspace. Okay, we had to leave a particular berth around the Falkland Islands. So there's apparently because that's British you airspace. Can, yeah, you so you so and you you can choose one or the other, but you don't get both. Interesting. And so so that geopolitics was, playing into Earth science. Yes, 
Yeah, because we so the the aircraft that we had, it's a small. It was a G five, as a Gulfstream five airplane. So it's it's so it should be this like fancy like you know business jet, but it's a science aircraft. So like they've stripped like they like they didn't put any of the, of the upholstery in. It's basically we no took this plane. Comforts. No creature comforts. There's lots of holes drilled in it that are patched up with like so it has all these little snorkels sticking out um, that are specially built so they don't put too much drag on the airplane. But it's a small plane and Punta Arenas is a windy, windy place. Mm-hmm. And so we had to be able to evacuate the plane from there because we didn't have a, an aircraft hangar. And so we would lose flight time on days when it was too windy. We'd be like, airplane has to go away. So we'd do these flights where we'd like, be like, well, can we do any science on the way to the evacuation point? And so we would evacuate up the coast of Chile and do samples up there. And then on the way back, we couldn't do samples because a lot of the, a lot of the um, scientific equipment required cryogenics. We need like dry ice or liquid gotcha. nitrogen okay. to run a lot of the systems. So you're, you're able to do some targets of opportunity, but not, yeah. not consistently. Yeah. So we, we and on those days where you know the plane was halfway up the coast of Chile, we're like, well, let's go see the penguins, there or you, go. you know, let's go let let's go be tourists because yeah. we're just sitting. Otherwise, we just sit in the conference room and twiddle our thumbs. Like, is the plane coming back today? No. Okay, let's go do something fun, which is kind of a hoot. But yeah, cool. And what 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 happens next? Uh, so what happens next? So in addition to sort of actually sort of finalizing the flux estimates, um, I then get to compare them to the various sort of climatologies and various uh, computer models I'm going to run. And then I'm going to take the whole campaign and use some of that same sort of infrastructure in some sense to actually say, okay, can I say something about, like we have those sort of those shorter-lived species, like the, that sort of that DMS, that stuff that's a, that's a sign of uh, recent um, algal growth, and say, well, if I can find a, a, a chunk of air that I know I sampled and didn't touch land for a long time, well, if I know all the DMS has can be no more than like five days old, I could actually say, well, remember again what DMS stands so for? So it's the uh, dimethyl sulfide. Okay, okay. So it's this. It's, uh, so it's a marker. It's a marker. Yeah. yeah. And but 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 it decays quickly, and so I can say, well, if I can if I can find a clean path, like so the air has only hit ocean for the past week, which you can do since it's basically the Pacific upwind. I can say, well, I know all that DMS had to come from this chunk of ocean, and I can actually estimate sort of how much. DMS is coming ocean actually sort of and someone can then say well that would imply sort of this kind of algal growth so we could actually say we could talk about the amount of growth that we, we saw in a broader swath of the ocean than just you know that little hundred kilometer stretch that we sampled over Drake Passage. Awesome and if people want uh, continued updates on this you're going to send me some links to my website but uh, you're also active on Twitter. I am. So what's your Twitter handle for people? My, my Twitter handle is M Smithma. before I got married my last name was Smith Martinez and so you go to college, they give you first initial M, and then as much as your last name, they'll fit in eight characters. So M Smith M A. M Smith M A. And so uh, we'll link to your Twitter uh, account on the website as well. And I assume you will, I mean, I assume part of your science outreach is tweeting updates yep, about this I, project. I, I throw up, you know, whenever I make a, a pretty enough picture that's worth sharing, I'll throw it out there. Very cool, very cool. Well, and I'll, <laughs> one last thing, I was kind of thinking about this as a joke, but like, how do we advocate for AGU to start allowing diacritical marks in their online registration because oh, yeah. <laughs> you've got a lot of accents so yeah so i will so <laughs> drawn I, onto your, yeah, your I have, id i have accents badge. on my eye on the eyes and my name and my and i have a hyphen I've, I've learned that like web like databases just do not handle hyphens or accents reliably and so i'm actually okay with it like okay like it doesn't really bother me so, so from a computer perspective you understand like, i get that it they like, can't accommodate the like it's not always it's not always a co- like but like they'll, they'll allow accents in like um or funny symbols in abstracts and stuff. So like, okay. I, I, so you still get the, you still, yeah. it, it appears and in public, yeah. in print the it, way you want it. It appears in print the way I want it to. It's That's just, good. and like, I mean, I just draw on my badge, right? Like, it doesn't really matter. To yeah, me. and then I just mispronounce your name and look like a jerk and then figure it out. I grew up in, <laughs> I grew up in Seattle. Like, I, I, I'm a cuss, I've, like, I remember when I was a kid, like, when a substitute teacher would come in the class, like, the whole class would correct the teacher when they oh, misread nice. my name. So like, it's a understandable mistake and, I don't think I should shame someone for trying their best. Like, mm-hmm. it's not their fault. They don't know. Um, and so I don't really sweat it. Awesome. Well, Martin, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your time, right? Thanks again to Martin for giving us some of his time and talking about uh, the outreach and the science that he's doing. Next up, we have Jane Zelikova. And just a reminder, there are a lot of links to a lot of different things in the show notes for this episode. So scienceorder.com if you want more information on what Martin was talking about and what we're about to hear from Jane. And I'm just realizing that I forgot to tell you guys what I am drinking because that's the part in the show where this would normally happen. So um, it's the middle of the day, so I'm having coffee. A uh, coffee from Stumptown Coffee Roasters in Portland, Oregon. 
It's the Holler Mountain Blend, and I don't normally go for blends, but my wife thought I would enjoy the name, which I do, and she thought I would enjoy the coffee, which I do, and the the roaster was closed because it was late, so we just had to buy whatever the co-op had, and so we got some delicious Stumptown Holler Mountain Blend, and I made it in a French press, and I've been drinking it all morning, and this is the last of the French press, and that makes me very sad, so I'm probably going to have to get up and make another French press soon, so I have the energy to finish editing this show. All right. Coffee time. Bye. Okay. So for the first ever live at AGU for Science Sort of, we are joined by returning guest Jane Zelikova. Hello, Jane. Hello. Jane, you've been stupid busy. I... Maybe you should be less busy, but in the meantime, tell us what you've been up to. Okay. Uh, well, the busyness has been really, I think, really good. I think I'll sleep when I'm dead. Jane Zelico, I just noticed. That oh yeah, no, named. someone. Could, they were like, ah, oh, we just give up. It's too hard. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll put the first six of the eight letters of your name and just stop there. <laughs> okay, this this sounds good. I don't want to fight you. Yeah. Since we last spoke, it's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah. Yeah. So you are now working as a fellow of the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Correct. But also you've been breaking laws to be a super advocate. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not sure if I'm breaking law, so let's... <laughs> let's cut that. So for anyone... Li- oh, you can keep it, but for anyone listening, uh, after a lengthy discussion of whether or not I've uh, violated the Hatch Act, which is an act that doesn't allow federal employees to speak out against it, or for any candidate or political right. party. Uh, it turns out that I probably didn't violate the Hatch Act. Um, and also, I'm not a federal employee, so that helps. So why would you even be in the running for having to have that conversation? What have you been doing? No. So, uh, well, I've been for the last year and a few months, I've been working in the Department of Energy as a AAAS fellow. And I am a science and technology policy fellow. So one of the things that I'm really supposed to be doing is learning how policy um, is using science or how science can inform policy. And uh, in the process, I've um, gotten really passionate about the things that the Department of Energy works on, including climate policy, which is what I work on. Okay. And since the election in November and the uh, election of Donald Trump and the many policies and um, I don't know what to call it. Since the election, <laughs> I've become very passionate about standing up for many different things and yes. speaking out against many different things. So which one do you want to start with? So what, are, what am I most passionate about? So I think the things that I've been really active uh, speaking out against is this anti-science and anti-knowledge rhetoric. Should right? I start recording? Nope. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Have you not been recording? I've been recording. Oh, okay. <laughs> you are the worst. <laughs> My mouth hurts from all the talking. Okay, so um, you uh, want to yeah. protect science. I want to protect science. So, I mean, if I had to like really be honest, I would say that I have felt the assaults on every level that I function of as a human. So I felt it as a woman with all the misogyny and sexism that is just basically being normalized and getting completely normalized across society. Mm-hmm. I have felt it as an immigrant. I felt it as a Jew. I felt it as a scientist. <laughs> I felt it as a human that cares about other people who are of different ideas, beliefs, colors, descent. Sure. And I just, I feel it like it's from every side. Right. And it was really hard to stay silent about it. And so, so you didn't. So I didn't. Right. And I wasn't the only one. So one of the things that's been really good is that I have an amazing network of women scientists that I'm friends with and that I talk to on a regular basis. And before the election, our conversations were you know, about what my friend's kids are doing, what we're doing for fun, like where we're going for runs, like planning vacations together. And then after the election, the text messages between us were about like how we were feeling and how much like we felt outrage and, mm-hmm. and, and how can, we can channel that and what can we do. And first, you know, the first few days it was a lot of upset and then we needed to turn that upset into action. So we started an email chain and invited some of our other women friends to kind of like have a venue for them to talk about what they're feeling. And that email chain grew to an open letter written from women scientists for women scientists with the idea that we could formally say the things that we were feeling upset about, but also a call to action and a call to support. Mm -hmm. So the letter basically 
stated that we as women scientists reaffirm our commitment to each other, to supporting each other as women and as scientists. And we're also reaffirming our commitment to um, stand up for equality and justice and science. And the website where people can read the letter? The website is www. 500 and 500 mm -hmm. womenscientists.org. Where did that name or where did that number, where did 500 come from? I know. So this is amazing. Uh, we, <laughs> it was just five of us and then we invited some friends and we were like, could we get 500 signatures? Like, wouldn't it be amazing if we got 500 signatures? Mm -hmm. So we posted the letter and we got 500 signatures within hours. And we surpassed that and went to 1,000 and then 5,000 and then 10,000. And now we're almost at 12,000 signatures from nine, more than 90 countries around the world. So the 500 was an aspirational number that we very quickly were like, well, we should have aspired <laughs> for 50,000. Website would have been harder to type in, though. Would have been harder to type in. More zeros. Five and then five There's zeros. like another zero. I mean, yeah. we probably should have said five. Five women scientists. Five women scientists. But then people would have been spelling out five. God, this is, it's lucky that we came, like, Shut we it down. stumbled upon Shut something. it down. <laughs> um, okay, so... Now that you've taken the step towards the with the open letter and the call to action, what are the next steps for 500 Women Scientists? How can people listening to the show who want to get involved, get involved, help you guys out, communicate their, their frustration that they might also be feeling? Well, so for one thing, uh, we want to be a voice. We want to be a voice for women. We want to be a voice for scientists. We want to be a voice for anyone that feels similar threats that we feel. Uh, and that means that just because you are a male scientist or a male non-scientist doesn't mean you can't support us. So you can still go to the website and sign the pledge as a supporter. Right. We have a little drop-down menu. We've gotten really fancy with our website <laughs> where you can choose whether you're signing as someone that, that self-identifies self as a woman scientist or as a supporter. Okay. So that's one thing. That would be really great. We want to grow our network. Um, the other thing is we have a website and we have a Facebook group. And we are trying to communicate with our membership and talk about next steps. So one of the things that we do is we update people with the kinds of actions they might take that are relevant to the things that we care about. So when we see that there are threats to science, we try to speak up and we give our um, the group concrete actions they can take. So call this congressman, do the following action, sign mm -hmm. this pledge, work with this community organization. If you're in this area, you can go to this pro protest, that kind of stuff. So political actions and uh, philanthropy actions and things that people can do. That's number one. Number two, we're doing things that are more inward facing and trying to build up women scientists in general. So we're starting to work on mentorship programs and linking women with, with mentors. One of the things that's turned, that, that has come out of this effort is learning that Many women have had no mentorship whatsoever mm -hmm. um, in science, and many women have never had a female mentor. And so those of us that have been really lucky and have had amazing mentors have really benefited from that. So we want to make sure that we can be an organization that brings mentors and people that they need a mentorship together. So that's an inward-facing thing. And then outward-facing, we really want to get... Um, active in getting women scientists out into those communities where science literacy is low and where maybe some of these like sexism and misogyny kind of ideas are taking root. And we want to work with local organizations to be a resource for those communities and to really reach people just through personal interactions and human decency. Because you've been working with those communities a lot with some of the energy stuff you've been doing. So you're, you've kind of been building that from a different angle. Yeah. So for the last year, I've been working. I work in the coal office at the Department of Energy, which is a, a really strange place for an ecosystem scientist who works on climate change to go to. But I thought it was really important to work with those communities and work on those issues because those are the things that we really have to decarbonize. So I've been traveling for the last year and a half nonstop. And a lot of my travels take me to very rural places, very like the places that actually are coal country, the places that we read about in the newspaper. <laughs> so I've been a lot to West Virginia, your home state. Yep. I've been to Southwest Virginia, Kentucky, Illinois, Indiana, Wyoming, Montana, Colorado, um, Utah, places that use a lot of coal, mm -hmm. where these kinds of impacts of losing coal jobs and all the things that go along with that are really being felt the most. Those are the people that are being left behind by our 
progressive society in one way or another. And those are the people that we need to reach. And so now you're attacking it from multiple angles, an energy angle and a women scientist angle. Yeah, I think I think the thing is that the thing that surprised me is um, that despite what my prior expectations of those communities are, I mean, those people have the same concerns as anyone else. They want their kids to go to a good school and they want to be able to have enough food on the table. And so they're coming at it from a very like they don't want anything different than what anyone else wants. Right. But they don't have the same access to information and the same sort of like built up critical thinking skills to be able to really assess which information is false and which isn't and what's really in the best interest of their community. And so I don't want to be a person that comes in there and tells them what's in their best interests, but I want to come in and say, I'm a scientist and here are the skills that I bring and I'm here to listen to you um, and think about some of the solutions that might apply to your community. But also I want to be a resource. So when you have a question later about something that relates to science, you know at least one or two scientists that you can reach out to personally. Because you know me. We sat down and had a beer or we had breakfast together or whatever. Mm -hmm. And like you know me on a human level, not on a I'm from the government and I'm here to tell you what to do level. Right. Is that hard? Is that hard to establish those connections? I think there is a general there is a general distrust of government and science, and that's difficult to overcome. So I just try to meet people where they are today. So where they are today may be that they want to talk about their kids or they want to talk about birding because they're really into birding. And so they hear that I'm an ecologist and that's something we can talk about. So those are the connections that I make. I don't push an agenda. Okay. And when those things come up, do you just have to like grit your teeth through some of the stuff you know is wrong or misguided or has that not really been an issue? That is always an issue. So I had a series of meetings where I spoke with coal miners and people that work in the coal plant in Montana. And for the most part, they were really well educated on the issues that affect them. But I got a lot of questions that were basically in the climate denial spectrum. And people came up to me afterwards and asked those questions. And I had, you know, maybe 45 minutes of conversations with people after I spoke. And the thing is that it's hard to be, it's, it's hard to combat those questions with facts when you don't have a lot of time to sit down and really dig into it. Yeah. So I just try to be really respectful and say, like, I'm here, I'm a resource. Here's the information that I know. I've seen these data. I've worked on these data myself. And so I'm happy to talk to you about this. Here's my phone number. We can talk anytime. And then you just go scream into your pillow. Then I go and scream in my pillow. <laughs> and, I, and I also take notes. So if you like look at my notebook where I have these meetings with coal companies and coal miners, and a lot of coal companies is where I write the things. I, I try to keep a very impassive like, face. It's mm-hmm. really hard because my face shows my, my emotions. And so I'm really working very hard to develop the Hillary face where she can like actually hear somebody talk shit crazy and keep her composure right I don't have that skill so i just like my notebook is sort of like my journal of like this is f- nuts <laughs> <laughs> and like i'll write it out in my journal like this doesn't make any sense so that's this is not based in reality system. i write it out in my journal and then not my journal it's my notebook it's my work notebook but this is where i write these things and i have to re-record that huh I mean, I, for people listening, we're recording this in like a service hallway. <laughs> yeah. There are elevators and it was the quietest trash cans. part we could find because it's not full of scientists, scientists trying to get are beer. So loud. We're not a quiet group. God. Except we're, at rallies where we're uncomfortable. We are super uncomfortable, and then we're super quiet. <laughs> if anyone tells us to chant, we're like, uh, we're not can chanters. we just write an article about this? Yeah. I haven't had time to read all the literature about the effects of chanting yet, so I'm not going to chant. Even then, I was hesitant to tweet. I'm hesitant to tweet these days. Yeah. No, I mean, like, the the tweet would be like, others are chanting. (laughs) (laughs) Sources. I have reason to suspect that there is chanting occurring near where I'm standing. (laughs) (laughs) And that I may or may not be in the crowd sort of chanting along. I'm I'm not chanting myself, so it's hard to know exactly what's happening. Yeah, we're just not good. We're not good ralliers, scientists. No, but then we have to be, right? So the thing we're too that- individual. Well, we're too individualistic, right? We're everybody like, you know, not your research is such a personal and unique thing, and literally no one else on the planet is as interested in the thing that you're doing as you. So then to say that we have to come together behind a common goal is not a thing scientists are, I don't think, well equipped for. Well, here's what I have to say to all these scientists, including myself. You are not the unique snowflake that you think you are. 
Well, that's so sad. I mean, your research is unique, and it's wonderful that you're doing the research that you're doing. But if you're not doing it for the common good of knowledge and extent, like expanding our understanding of the universe or expanding our understanding of our lives, then you have to really check yourself. And who, who are you doing this for? Right. And if you don't think the scientific enterprise, if you think the scientific enterprise is under threat, then you have to really think about how to allocate your energy because you may want to just burrow down in your lab and do your work. But I think that's true for a lot of scientists. There they, may not be a lab to do work in. So if you don't stand up for yourself, no one else will. And if we don't all stand up together, no one will speak for us. And we're talking obliquely about the rally to stand up for science that just happened today outside AGU. It wasn't necessarily an AGU-sponsored event, but there were a handful of scientists in attendance. There were like three to 400. Right, but we were just talking about how this meeting has 26,000 scientists. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think the thing is, like, it makes me super uncomfortable to do this. And before this election, I was, like, politically engaged, but I wasn't an activist. Right. And so the thing that's happened is, like, it's pushed me to be an activist because, for one thing, I feel personally threatened. Right. But we all should. And if we believe that the scientific enterprise is something that can withstand this kind of assaults without our engagement, and if we think that we have champions that are going to speak for us, then we really have to assess if that's true. And I think that it's not. Okay. Um, you also have a movie. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about your movie. Oh, my gosh. So, um, in addition, so let's just, let's just say that the sleep, fa- the sleep factor has gone away. Yeah. You were telling me about how, like, yeah, your, your sleep schedule is not there's, human anymore. There's no sleep. There's no exercise. And there's a lot of eating on the road. So the health, the health factor is low. The health is low. But. What's been really good is that the things that I'm doing are things I'm really passionate about, including this science movie. So uh, The End of Snow. I don't know if we said the title. We have, yeah, we haven't talked about it yet. It's been premiering all over the country. All over the country. From Laramie to San Francisco. So from, from Boulder to Laramie to San Francisco to Bozeman. So, so far we've just done the Western tour. Yeah, the Rocky, the Rocky Mountain region. The Rocky Mountain region. Featuring San Francisco. Featuring San Francisco. As per usual, San Francisco inserts itself into everything. And what's the movie about? So the movie called The End of Snow is a collaboration between me and my really good friend and uh, inspiration, Morgan Heim. She's a filmmaker. She and I met teaching science communication to a bunch of scientists. Did you meet in Costa Rica? Or? We met, well, we met in Boulder, but then we spent time in Costa Rica together. Yeah. So she and I wrote a grant and got money to make a short film about uh, my research on snow, the impacts of climate change on snow hydrology. So um, as we were writing this film, we uh, realized that it was really important to tell a very engaging human-centered story, and that we didn't need another climate change doomsday film, and that we needed to make something that was really going to just engage people on an emotional level. So we, over a year, shot this short 20-minute film about sort of my journey as a scientist to discover what's happening to snow in the West. So we, we filmed it in um, Colorado and Wyoming. And we like, spent a few months editing it and were able to premiere it at the Boulder Adventure Film Festival. And now it's played in Boulder and in Laramie a couple of weeks ago, Laramie, Wyoming. And then it's also played in Bozeman, Montana. And it's playing here at AGU in San Francisco this week. Awesome. And how, how was it? I mean, I know you've done like short, very, very short films before, but how was it like being a part of an actual production? Uh, it was super fun. Like beyond it was so so fun the the thing that i didn't like is that i was like the on camera talent the talent and so the camera was always in my face (laughs) and like i had to narrate the film so i narrated the film which means i had to make peace with how i sound on the radio which is terrible i'm listening to you right now i'm live monitoring this interview it's the worst it's just awful (laughs) it's awful and at some point like we did a mock-up narration and mo did it morgan yeah, did the narration. I was like, yeah. oh my God, this sounds so much better. Can it just be you? And she's like, no, it has to be. But also, like, she probably thinks that she sounds as bad as you think you sound. Like, she that's a human. Lovely. But every, we all sound lovely. We just don't think we sound lovely when we hear ourselves. No, but who is like, who is sitting in my head and being like, this sounds terrible? You are. You're the only person who feels that. I feel that I am not okay with this. Because all of us, I mean, I had to come to grips with this when we started podcasting because 
your, your own voice in your own head, it's rattling around your sinuses and your jaw, and it's going in your ears from both inside and outside. So, like, you're getting all this crazy stuff that everybody else is just hearing what you sound like. And well, so, you sound the same. Yeah, you sound the same, too. You just don't sound the same to you because of the way... It's literally everything going on in your head, both mentally and physically, the physical acoustics of a human skull uh, this that make is, you sound different sucks. than you think you sound, okay. but well, you fair sound enough. the same to everybody. Fair enough. So anyway, yes. So uh, the film was really fun. One of the chapters we filmed with a full female crew, so it was me and Morgan and the production assistant, Corey Price, and then the second cinematographer, Allie Nichols. And so it was really, really fun, all-girl crew. We were out in Wyoming. You were in the medicine. We were, uh, but we were the snowies. out. We were out near the Tetons. Near the Tetons. Oh, I the thought you were out in the snowies. For the third chapter. The, oh, okay. The first chapter was in the snowies. The second chapter was in Gothic, Colorado, and the third chapter was near the Tetons. And the, the chapters are seasonal, right? Yeah. So the way that we structured the film is, uh, it's the past, the present, and the future, and it's also the fall, the winter, and spring. So the idea is like we sort of show you what the climate science tells us about the incoming changes to snowpack in the mm-hmm. West. Then we talk about like what we've measured in our lifetime. And then we talk about sort of like, how can we adapt? What can we do? What, what does the future hold? And is there any hope? Is there any hope or is that a spoiler? And you can't say, Oh man, I feel like you should go see the film. I don't want to blow the, I have that opportunity because I'm here at AGU, but people who aren't here, how, are they going to have the opportunity to see it at some point? Yeah, I think what we're doing now is it's making the rounds at film festivals across the country. So uh, at this point, it's not fully online, although you can see the second chapter of it called The Snow Guardian, which we did put online. It won second place in the World Climate Film for Climate competition. Congrats. Which is amazing. And it went viral, which is a thing that happens. I, I mean, I feel like I've seen your 500 Women Scientists going viral as well. That did also go viral. Yeah. I feel you're like very viral. I'm viral right now. Yeah, it's because you're not sleeping enough. I sleep nothing. <laughs> I sleep no, no time. You I can't need even to put sleep words more. together. I need to sleep more. And maybe go for like a two-mile run. Yeah. That together will fix it all. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, www.endofsnow.com is the <sighs> website for the film. And I think we've posted the Snow Guardian chapter in there. Once it plays the rounds of the festivals over the next few months, we'll post the whole film online. Okay, great. It'll be free. Awesome. So we'll uh, we'll keep people posted on that, and we can you know tweet and put that on our Facebook page once it is gone live officially. Yeah. But, beyond but, when but this in the meantime, posts. you can put, post the Snow Guardian. Yeah, it's we lovely. Will. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So to recap, go pledge to help out. Five hundred women scientists. Women scientists. Follow us on Twitter. Five hundred women say. 500 Women's Eye on Twitter. They can follow you on Twitter. They can follow me on Twitter. Uh, Zelly J. What's my... I think I'm Zelly J. Uh, let me see. Okay. I think it's J underscore Zelikova. Ah, but no one can spell that. No one can spell that, AGU. including the AGU. These are smart people that can't spell here. I am J underscore Zelikova. Oh, Boris. Good Lord, people. I know. Doug Face is on the Twitter page. I miss that guy. I miss him so much that it hurts so much all the time. Dog times, with science sort of. Just, it just, I like, if I still had him, I don't think I could keep the lifestyle that I have, which is, like, basically, I'll, like, I'll live on a plane. Mm-hmm. In fact, like, my Instagram feed at this point is mostly airport carpet, because I've been, like, taking pictures of all the airport carpet and having people guess where I am. Do you want people to follow you on Instagram, too? Is that another thing we should promote? I think that is, that is Zelly underscore J. That's probably why I thought that was your Twitter handle, because I see you on Instagram more than I see you on Twitter. Zelly underscore J. There are lots of ways to find me. Yeah, but I think if I had if I had the dog face, I, I wouldn't leave him. So I wouldn't be able to be an activist. To save the world. To save the world. <laughs> I'd just save the Boris. <laughs> okay, so 500 Women Scientists, go sign the pledge. Follow all of the social media things. Go watch Chapter 2 of End of Snow. Yeah, at endofsnow.com. And you can post these things online on your page. On the Science Order page? Yeah. No, yeah, we'll do that. I didn't know if you were talking to the listener. And the listener, you can get in touch if you have questions, if you have ideas for what we can do as 500 Women Scientists or what we should be doing as scientists communicating about science. Um, these are the things that I really care a lot about and I'd be excited to hear. Awesome. Well, I hope people do get in touch. Yeah. And thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. 
And that'll do for part one of AGU Special Edition Oceans and Outreach. Thanks again to Martine and Jane for talking to me and putting up with my stupid jokes and lack of understanding of what it is they're doing. Uh, so please go to the website, scienceorb.com, and find the show notes for this episode to see all the links to all the different things that they were talking about. And make sure you follow them both on Twitter to receive updates on the cool work that they're doing. Um, let's do a quick paleo pow i guess let me i'm gonna have to pause the recording and go find one because i'm not actually recording at my computer like i normally do so give me give me just a second people all right i'm back at my computer why can't i hear anything on this record oh that's why hang on i bet that changes things and it does all right if there's slightly more background noise now it's because i'm at my computer which is running some other processes which is making its fan run loud but i need to be here to do a quick paleo pal so let's find one for everyone to enjoy okay we got a donation from victor c and he sent a little message along with that that says dear ryan and co all the best for the holidays here's a little something to keep the mission of science communication going in the new year it's becoming more important than ever victor Uh, Victor, I think you're correct. So thank you for the cash. We really appreciate it. I use some of the money that you guys all contribute to the show to buy a new fancy recorder and microphone. So I was able to get decent sound quality for the interviews that you just heard. And so uh, with that, I'll wrap it up and thank you all for listening. We'll have part two of this soon with more oceans and outreach at AGU, which you know is going to lead to a whole lot more science. And then... Maybe you all just say sort of, and you kind of like shout it out loud wherever you are in the world, and then people will look at you, and then you just hold up your phone and go, it's a podcast, and I had a call and response. I felt obligated to do it, and now you should go listen to the podcast. I think that would be good for all of us in the new year to start doing that. All right. See you guys soon with part two. Bye. Visit sciencesortof.com for show notes, links to all the stories we talked about, and ways to interact with the hosts, guests, and other listeners. Science Sort Of is brought to you by the Brachialobe Media Network of Podcasts, with audio engineering by Tim Dobbs of the Encyclopedia Brunch Podcast. That's all for this week. See you next time on Science Sort Of. Now, that was perfect. We're going to do it again, but this time I'm going to record it. I just want to punch you in the face. (laughs) That was recorded.